Good morning. Today's the only day it rains in Orlando, so it's a good thing you have all day program here. <laughs> As Byron is kindly pulling up my presentation, I want to tell you how grateful I am for the chance to speak to all of you today. Um, first, I thank uh, Dr. Stacey Ishman, who I've known her for a long time as a colleague, as a friend. Her commitment is second to none when it comes to education for students, advanced practitioners, just anybody who comes within, um, I guess, just in the world, right? So all the years that she's um, given me opportunities to contribute, like to the American Academy of Pediatrics, to this uh, event, um, and all others, I, I don't take that for granted, so thank you. And Laura, Laura, wow, I'm not afraid of many people, but boy, is she on the ball. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I tell you, thank you so much. What a pleasure to meet you and for this opportunity. Um, and to share this opening hour with um, our EVP, Dr. Danani, it's, it's fantastic as well. So um, here I am. I'm driving here this morning. I, left, I live 10 minutes from the Orlando airport in Lake Nona, and um, I thought about something. I thought about how in my career, so I'll be 49 this month, right? I've been practicing for 17 years out of fellowship. I thought about the role that advanced practitioners have played in my life from the time I left medical school. In, medic in medical school, I, I don't think I appreciated nor was I formally educated on what that was like for the rest of my career and how our lives would intersect. So my first 10 years, uh, actually, so I first uh, got exposed to advanced practitioners in um, residency. I trained at Mayo, and I'll, I'll never forget um, both in Rochester and specifically the three months I spent in Scottsdale. There were three surgical, uh, three physician assistants. Um, these gentlemen really improved my head and neck skills. They taught me how to operate. They, they helped run the service. You know, my education in big part is due to the advanced practitioners. Practitioners. Then I go to fellowship. I had additional interactions, not as much there. And then in the 10 years before I came here, um, I was in Kansas City at the university, but also at the Children's Hospital. There, we had a huge team of nurse practitioners and, and also physician assistants. And um, now, finally, I come here to become the division chief. I got to grow up, recruit, and hire advanced practitioners on my team, which I'll share with you. And I think about how I've learned and have been given the opportunity to work with them, to empower them to practice, practice at the top of scope, not just for me and my team, but for the patients and families. And so um, I just want you to know that I had all that in mind today before I come and share about uh, my journey. So. From burnout to well-being, awareness, accountability, and action is how I've titled this. So I'm going to start by um, playing this video for you. Is there volume, Byron? Louder. Can you make it louder? <laughs> I'm so sorry. We're going to redo that just so that it's louder. No, it's, yeah, it's good. Can I stop it and start yeah. over? Yeah. Okay. It changed it on its own here. Sorry. Okay. Okay, we're going to try again here. Okay, let's see if it's too loud. Let's, let's go for it. Huh? Okay, ready? Am, am I good? Okay, mm -hmm. here we go again. Yes. No, 
I am so sorry. We checked this morning. <laughs> But it's not loud enough. Can you turn it up louder? Okay, you know, we'll just move on. I, I, yeah, that's fine. We'll move on. I, I need it louder for my next video for sure. Okay, yeah. so, okay. No financial disclosures. I have experienced high degree of burnout. Very committed to taking better care of myself and everybody else around me. Oh, and one more disclosure, I'm human. I want you to think about that because that's actually very relevant to um, this topic. 2009-2010, and I'll tell you a little more about my personal story of how I reached high degree of burnout, but 2009 and 10 was when the uh, absolute worst uh, rock bottom for me. At that time, I didn't know there was something called burnout. In fact, I was burned out, became, it became so popular and widely visible. But I want to tell you that in 2012, I had the chance to give my first instruction course at the academy um, on burnout. Very few people came, and that's okay. The academy's been kind to me. Every year, I've been able to give that instruction course. And over the first several years, maybe from 2012 to 15, you know, the awareness suddenly exploded, right? Um, the last three years, I have really committed myself, as I'm still on this journey, in every speaking opportunity, to reflect and share on, well, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do about it? Because we certainly have so much on various forms of media, but where is my personal accountability? What is it that when you leave, when I leave you today and when you leave this conference, what is gonna be the takeaway that you are empowered to do to experience your life and career differently? that is not dependent on a lecture, an article, data, et cetera. So I want you to know that I haven't mastered it, but I'm working on it every day because I am grateful instead of doing something terrible or a bad outcome uh, in spite of some rare occasional negative thoughts. Thank God I'm, I'm here today and I'm grateful for life and breath. And I work on and inspire people around me how to ex experience it, very engaged living. Okay, but I will, of course, get very detailed about what not only you can do and what I've learned about what hospital systems, organizations, and the physicians and physician leaders that work with you, what is their obligation and what they need to be doing. So um, indulge me when I share with you a little bit about what my team and I are doing as a part of the Moore's Pediatric Health System. Um, I like to imagine it as the Mayo Clinic, but for children. The Moore's is a $6 billion endowment, $2 billion dedicated to the care of primarily children and senior citizens. It started out with Mr. DuPont up in Delaware, but we're across multiple states with countless locations. In Florida, we are in Pensacola, Jacksonville, and then I moved here because the um, Children's Hospital opened um, exactly six and a half years ago. Florida is the third most populous state in the nation, and boy, are the children's and families underserved. So uh, I hope you get a chance someday, if not during this trip, to come to the area called Lake Nona. This is touted as medical city. So seven, eight years ago, it was nothing but cows and green pastures, which I love. Um, I did love my time in the Midwest. However, if you go now, you'll see that it's now the new home of the USTA. So anybody who loves tennis, um, that will be meaningful to you. It's a training ground. Um, we have the largest VA hospital in the United States, so that's there as well. The Children's Hospital is the top left. And then, of course, um, we have our medical school. UCF College of Medicine just celebrated its 10-year anniversary. 
So I came to join this, this amazing work. I'm also very proud to have come and built our diverse team. I serve as chief of ENT and also audiology. I have to tell you when I first came, we had four audiologists, uh, I was surgeon number two, and I remember my initial conversation where an, an audiologist said, we're doing fine, we don't need you, because the concept of having a chief over both of them didn't sound, seem right to them. I listened, I shared, and I think um, I earned the respect and ability for us to be one team team when they very quickly I show how I can leverage my voice as a physician leader to get them resources and things they have been asking for. Um, there was a lot of complaints of they're invisible, they didn't feel they were respected uh, as an independent advanced practitioner. So that was very early in my journey at Nemours uh, on the critical importance and the ability I can influence um, in our relationship as we work together to serve patients. So here's my team. Last year, we're in six locations because Nemours has a huge footprint in Central Florida. You see, there's so many children, and for a long time, other than Gangsville, there's all children, that's an academic center, Miami, all children's in Tampa. We have excellent practitioners, but let's just be honest, there are a lot of patients with Medicaid um, that just cannot have access to subspecialists. So I'm very proud that that was the, the biggest impact we've been making is last year we served over 26,000 patients and families. So here's my reality. I don't know about yours. I facilitate physician leadership programs in our organization. Our physicians, our physicians who are taking care of healthy, sick children and their families, we're at a very high degree of disengagement and burnout ourselves in my organization. So I put this slide up, I'm gonna read it to you. This is why it's so hard for the woman who's standing here speaking with you, right? It's still hard for me because I'm trying to deliver the highest quality academic level of care with the strongest mission. I came to join the Morris because we will take care of you no matter what color, what you look like, your background, your ability to pay. But this is like the worst time, it seems like, right? Highest rate for physician burnout, lack of well-being, suicide. Um, I'm bringing that film, Do No Harm, the documentary to our hospital this month. We have limited resources. You're probably thinking the woman just said $2 billion. Yeah, well that's two billion, that's in perpetuity to take care of people forever. Sometimes I feel like I have to fight for a paper clip, right? Um, we talked about budget earlier. If I have to tell you how many performance and budget for my advanced practitioner that I have to do to justify the hiring, and the whole time saying, you know what, you cannot measure people's worth by RVU because my advanced practitioners are spending hours doing the care conference for the complex trach and the G2 and working with family so that I, as a surgeon, and being able to operate so that I can do the other things I want to do. But we're not measuring that, right? So trust me when I tell you I fully embrace and understand the challenges that um, advanced practitioners face in our healthcare system. And we are inadequately compensated. We've never sent anyone to collection. You know, in the Morris, everything was free. It was like Shriners till 1989, but you can't keep the lights on and you can't have the scope of practice without having folks try to pay. We get angry mommy calls. I'm not in control of your copay going up this amount. You know, so, so all that stuff aside, vulnerable population. My team serves 74% Medicaid. Okay, this is why it's hard. And all the same time, yes, I'm married. I have a child. I'll talk to you about my life. Okay, so um, I don't know. This is a slide from my good friend Dana Thompson. Dr. Thompson and I, um, sh she was uh, my guest in my course last year. Personal well being is shaped by a sense of purpose and balance. Okay, purpose, purpose, purpose driven living. Got to know what your purpose is because it'll drive your behavior, it'll drive how you delegate your time and your energy. This is my sense of purpose. I put on multiple pictures, but in the center is my beloved husband, David. We've been married 15 years. Um, he hates it that I tell him I speak, talk about him in public. So if you ever meet him, don't tell him. <laughs> my daughter, Claire, just turned 13. She's my miracle pregnancy. My experience with infertility was for sure a factor in my high degree of burnout, and then secondary infertility as well. 
Okay. But all the other collage of photos is this is this is what I couldn't see when I was heading towards burnout and during high degree of burnout. I didn't see my life in technicolor. This is my life. And all of you have a slide that looks just like this. Your family, your colleagues, your patients. Um, and what I've learned now that I share with, that I, I just lost completely was not understanding what happened to me, how I lost joy in my day-to-day -day encounters with patients, with another human being just um, had nothing left to give, right? So I won't go too much into, you know, now in 2019, I don't spend a lot of time talking about the, 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 defin the academic definition, but you'll see it there. This is defined by Dr. Christina Moslock. She's a PhD um, out in, in the Berkeley area. Three subscales, emotional exhaustion, when you're just like, man, I have nothing left to give. Leave me alone. I can't, I, I can't, does anyone ever feel that way? I think I felt it four times yesterday. <laughs> okay. Okay. Depersonalization, when you get there, you are in survival mode, right? You, the only way to survive is there's gotta be some distance. I really can't care about you right now, whether you're my patient, my spouse, my kid, don't know. But I'm in a very terrible place where I don't have the emotional capacity for you. Okay. And then when you get there, you start to also alter how you view yourself. You have a reduced sense of personal accomplishment. But the takeaway is, it's not, it's a spectrum. It's not you have burnout or you don't. Oh, look at her, she's burnt, or look at him. You know, no, I don't, I don't have it. It's a spectrum. It's low, moderate, or high degree. So our hope every day is for ourselves and those around us, what do we have to do to try to keep it in low degree? Of course, recognize when you go into high and, and then get yourself back. Okay, so what does it really feel like? That's what I like talking about. Okay, so I'll tell you, 2009, here it comes. I, was, I started my faculty job in 2003. Um, little bit of background. I think this is important. Every one of us has a story. I spent my childhood in, in Taipei, Taiwan. I was there for 10 years. I had a doting mother and father. I was the only child. My mother got diagnosed with breast cancer. I spent three years of my childhood in, in a hospital. Okay, so right away, and back then there's no outpatient chemo, so significantly tra early childhood trauma, no question. She dies, we immigrate here, I have a stepmom. I don't need to tell you, if, if I'm hugging a lot, I'm making up for my cultural deficiency and inability to say I love you and hug. So this lack, this desire for deep, deep human connection is, um, is what I compensate for, right? So, okay. My whole life then is being an overachiever. I think I'm trying to earn love and attention and acknowledgement that I'm a worthy human being. So then I get out of training and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to as a rock star physician, you know? I'm, I'm building a clinical practice. In my, I'm earning the number one PZNT to be referred to, preferred by mom. I am doing research, I am writing, teaching. You, say, you ask me, I say yes, okay? Meanwhile, I, you know, work my, my husband and trying to get pregnant and, you know. So 2009, 2010, boy, I'm, I'm busy, like everybody else, seeing patients. I'm always running. I'm late. I'm late. I'm late to the OR. I'm late to the clinic. I'm late. I'm late. I started waking up every day in so much pain. I couldn't get out of bed. I'm like, oh my God, you're not even 40. What the heck is wrong with you? In hindsight, I'm probably dehydrated most of the time. I'm terrible about drinking water. I got up at 3 a.m. this morning and drank two glasses because I realized I didn't have a sip the entire day yesterday. I'm still working on it. Anxiety, I hit menopause at 40, who does that? Okay, I mean, I, I didn't know what was happening to me. All I knew is I started having very negative thoughts. I mean, here I am finally having my miracle pregnancy. I've got a gorge, did you see my family? They're kind of good looking, okay. <laughs> I love children. My heart is about taking care of people, but I didn't want to do it anymore. I just wanted a temporary cancer diagnosis so I can stop. I want to stop. 
That's what burnout starts to feel like. Every time your pager goes off, you're saying you know, bad words in your head, right? Every time somebody wants to talk to you, ask you something. <laughs> okay, I have history of depression, shocking, right? Yeah, I, I had suicidal ideation in high school because no matter with a GPA of 4.4, what I really needed, I didn't have. But, you know, that, that's okay. As a grown woman now, I can go back and own my life and own my past and understand how I got here. So um, that was the time I will tell you a couple things that saved me. I went to my chair. I, I told them what something's not quite right. And at the time, I thought, you know, it must be my job and my institution. I'm just at the wrong place. So I went ahead and interviewed at five places around the country and realized I wasn't ready to leave. But you know what happened during that few months when I was interviewing? For the first time, I sat on airplanes and I didn't run and go and do stuff. And I looked out the window and I saw the clouds and I had time to think. I wasn't on this automatic pilot rushing all day long. And I thought, how did you get here? You have a gift. You won the lottery. You're the immigrant who came, whose family struggled, and you trained at the Mayo Clinic. Look at you. You got a husband, a, a kid, a house. You, you make a great living. What happened to you? And, and that time, that reflection was the wake up that said, uh-uh, I don't want cancer, and I don't want, I, I just want to embrace the rest of my life and just be the best human I can be. And I've got so much love to give, and I've got so much work to do. And that helped me significantly. And then also going to a double AMC mid-career women professional development seminar where I met 200 other women, faculty, just this is nothing against men. I've had tremendous mentoring and amazing male colleagues who've helped me where I am today. But it really changed me. It really changed me. So suicide, you know, we hear about that quite a bit. And that's because I can tell you right now, most people that commit suicide don't want to die, I don't think. They want out of pain. They want out of pain. I didn't want to do something bad to myself. I just didn't know how to stop what was happening to me, and I didn't know where to go for help, right? And I haven't even had time to talk about second victim, right? You're, you're, if you're in the OR with me, and you know, when I lost the tonsillectomy patient who was found in, dead in bed two days after a tonsillectomy, it destroyed me. And that very next day, I had 15 cases at a surgery center. Eight of them were tonsillectomies. I was crying in the corner, sobbing and shaking, and I didn't know what to do with the rest of my life. And that day, a pediatric anesthesiologist who's a good friend who said to me, Julie, you're going to have to make a decision. We can cancel today, and you can go home. What do you want to do? And I was crying, and I said, Ron, if I cancel today, what about the rest of my life? You see, the fact that one child can have a bad outcome means every kid I touch had that potential. And I didn't know what to do with that. But we didn't have any programs. There was no counseling. I had PTSD from that. I had another horrific one from a tonsil bleed that ended up requiring external carotid ligation. You know, when you give seven units of blood and hemoglobin is four and 22 units of platelet and you're in there and I'm a woman who's never been in the military, who's never been to war, but those four hours that day, they changed me. My husband and kid didn't know how to help me, right? I mean, my daughter was young. Uh, my husband would see me come home. I'm not eating, I'm not sleeping, but from the outside, Side. You better believe I'm the rock star that didn't call in sick, that did everything that I needed to do so that I have this, you know, what, 49-page CV? Who's counting, right? But this is, a, this is me. This is what I didn't do to take care of myself, and I'm openly sharing with you because whether you're a physician, a PA, or whoever you are, if you are in the career of taking care of other humans, you need to fully embrace that you're human too, and we got to find a way to take care of that. Now, the things I'm not going to repeat, we talk about systems issues and personal issues. I will say about the EHR, you know, I have partners, uh, colleagues, right? You know that commercial I showed you earlier? I don't think they realize, because it's a kid, he's in his pajamas. How many people here on nights and weekends may be in their own pajamas logging in to finish their chart? You can raise your hand, raise them higher, let me see it. 
Okay, so that's when you're actually not, you're not enjoying your life, right? But it's a necessity. I'm gonna tell you that I challenge myself to do differently. I'm gonna brag about my incredibly high Prescani scores. I was convinced that I, because I, parents love me, moms love me. If you don't trust me, check Facebook, okay? <laughs> but I will tell you that I used to take notes while talking to them, eye contact would never break it. And then I would leave the room, but then for the morning clinic, I do an hour of charts for the afternoon clinic. I do another hour of charts. I try to finish it before I go home, so I'm not doing it at home. 18 months ago, I said, you know what? I'm going to change my thinking. I'm going to challenge myself to have the same Press Gainey score, but learn how to spend the time optimizing my template, and I will do it so that I give still that human Julie Way awesomeness while still <laughs> closing my encounter majority of the time. And I'm here to tell you I did it. Okay, so setting expectations, I come in. Um, Mr. White, I, if I, the way they set up this room is kind of crazy, right? You're gonna see my beautiful back. No, I wouldn't say that to a man. That may not be appropriate. I, I would say, I would say, you know, I, if I'm not looking at you, it's because I'm gonna do some documentation because your pediatrician's gonna get a note as soon as we're done today and you wouldn't have to repeat anything to them and we're all on the same page. As Soon as I said that, oh yeah, okay. I said, and when I'm done, I'm gonna wash my hands and see Johnny and when if we are to talk about anything, you're gonna get you're gonna get my full undivided attention. So I, I had to learn how to do that, and I wanna tell you, if you do that and stop taking, doing your charts, you can find a way to be more efficient. Okay, I like to talk a lot, so keep me track on time. Right. Um, I'm here to speak to not physicians, to advanced practitioners. So um, in preparation for this talk, I wanna tell you to please go to the AAPA. There's actually quite a bit. If you just type in burnout on there, um, it, it talks about, uh, it has data, it has some research and some things that, that I'm about to show you. Are PAs burned out? Absolutely, you're at the same risk as I am. So um, can I ask for a show of hands, how many people are in year five to nine of being a PA? So, oh, there's a fair number. Okay, so on this side, on the top left, I just wanna point out to you, uh, professionally fulfilled. You guys filled out something, or maybe some of you did. It's called the Professional Fulfillment Index. So this is the data that I found in the AAPA. So 72.8% in that five to nine year range seems like a sweet spot. That's the highest for reporting professionally fulfilled. But that's also, you know, being fulfilled takes energy because <laughs> you, and it takes time. And so about 50% that says they're also exhausted at work, right? But overall burnout, you know, good it, about 32%, I think, based on that graph there. And then emergency medicine was the, you know, I don't have to worry about that, right? No EDPAs here. Um, emergency medicine was cited as the, uh, the highest degree of burnout. Surgical subspecialties was at about 25%. Primary care was listed a little bit higher. So, you know, overall the data here shows that the good news is, you know, oh, well, the bad news. 21% eh, reported a lot to extremely when asked the question, I have a sense of dread about, you know, a work that I have to do. Uh, or uh, um, a lot to extremely, 44% answered um, a lot or extremely to I'm emotionally exhausted at work. Okay, so um, the National Academy of Medicine, the Dr. Donani, um uh, mentioned, uh, they actually published a paper, and all this is available, the slides and, and the articles you'll be able to see when you have access to my talk. Burnout, job satisfaction amongst physician assistants. So um, the, this was a very nice article that kind of summarizes. So I'm gonna give you some key things that I found. So one in eight were considering quitting due to stress. Um, Female tend to report higher than men. I suspect there's more female PAs, I'm not sure. But in general, women have more emotional exhaustion than men. We're wired differently, we're more emotional creatures, right? Um, turnover estimates, it costs an employer 100,000 to quarter of a million per physician assistant. So together, if every PA quit, the estimated economic impact was $2 billion, okay? Forget $2 billion, I just, my team and I could not get through our day with our advanced practitioner, you can't put a price tag on that. 
But again, I mentioned to you already ER, primary care, hospice, palliative care, oncology. Job and career satisfaction, however, generally remain high. And I think that's because of the adaptable nature. The good news for all of you is if you got fed up with ENT, you can transition into another specialty. Okay, it's a good thing Dr. Ishman and I love otolaryngology because we're kind of stuck. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, you know, yes, just like everything else, you know, we, we need to have data. And as I'm sitting here listening to our EVP, Laura, please remind me what a terrific opportunity to take this group to either measure burnout using the Mayo Clinic Well Being Index or, or some other way of identifying things that, um, that can help us. So, once again, I won't belabor strategies for PAs to prevent burnout, burnout risk of malpractice, PA heal thyself, this is all in the, the website. Okay, and these are three additional, two additional papers, three. Uh -huh. I can't count this morning. Okay, um, burnout job satisfaction, stress level. You know, the second paper, I just read the abstract. This is, you know, little, not as applicable globally. It was for rural physician assistants. And then finally, Dr. Shanafelt, who is the leader uh, in, the U, in the U.S. and around the world in his academic work on this topic, he's now using their tool to measure well-being in nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So this is just a depiction of what happened to me when I, when I shared with you earlier about my issues. Um, full disclosure, you know, my husband and I never considered divorce, but you better believe we've had counseling, we've had coaching, I've had professional coaching, personal coaching, because <laughs> the mind is a funny thing. It keeps defaulting to the layers that we grew up with, and it's just constant work. So. Um, Oh, I have to interject this. You know, 360, as a physician leader in my organization, I had to get a 360. As a part of that, I had my daughter and husband rate me. And this is very humbling. I got extraordinary remarks from all my people at work. But the people who rated me the lowest was my own husband and daughter. And I needed to own that, and I still own it, okay? Um, because, you see, we talk about work-life balance. Um, if any of you read ENT Today, uh, Dr. Chu is so kind. I've written two articles. My third one will come out. The title is Work-Life Imbalance, because when you look at the Latin word or the root of balance, that's equal part. There is no longer equal part. How can you have equal part work and life when the number of hours spent doing the activities doesn't equate, right? So work spills over into my night, my weekend, and I'm here to tell you, if you don't reclaim it for yourself, your organization and system can't do that for you. I'm gonna skip a couple. This is after going through the high degree of burnout when I took my energy and new awareness and decided to launch Women in Medicine and Science in our campus and really just, you know, uh, and we welcome men too, and then this has been, uh, kind of took on a life of its own, and I'm very proud of what it's done for the University of Kansas uh, since that time. So I moved to Florida, because this is how you recover. <laughs> okay. More photos of, of what's happening today for me, right, is people. High quality interactions with your colleagues, your loved ones, this is how you're gonna survive, and this is how you're gonna live your best life. And I hope you'll take that opportunity uh, in a setting like this to do that. Okay, so the accountability, here's the bottom line. I've, gone, I've given a lot of talks, I've been to a lot of talks about burnout. But here, I'm here to challenge every one of you, you know, you in the plaid shirt, you in the purple, you in the green. Who is really responsible for your well-being? Is it the ENT doc you work with? Is it the hospital system you work with? Is it your, who, who? So I'd like you to, I think you kind of know the answer to that. I had to really look in the mirror and figure out what I was not doing for the sake of being haven't I done enough? I work all day. I take care of kids. I operate. I'm exhausted. I, 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 I look at the kids. I, one kid. I cook five nights a week. I'm taking care of my husband. My neighbors want to bring their kid with a sore throat by. Right? <laughs> so these are all the reasons, by the way, that I don't exercise. Okay, I'm just going to tell you right now because I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. B.S. I had to call myself out on that. That's complete nonsense, right? 
Nonsense. So second thing was, um, you know, understanding who's my best self. I don't know you, but I don't know who your best self is. My best self is the woman that brings all this energy. When I joined the Moors, my nickname is Tsunami. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not destructive, not destructive. But um, <laughs> don't kid yourself for a second. When I'm done here, I got eight cases, and then I go home tonight. But when I walk in the door, what I realized was for years, I don't know where that awesome Julie Way was, but she didn't come home to her husband and kid. She walked in and started ranting and raving about how crappy her day was and oh my God and oh and I hate my organization and these people are stupid and I didn't know surgeons were so difficult till I became a surgeon in chief and you know whatever. What little time we had as a family I spent ranting and raving and reliving my day that I convinced myself was crappy. I sucked out the positive from what little time we had. I didn't bring my best self home. So when I pull in the garage, I always say, Julia Wei, what is tonight gonna be? What are you gonna bring through that door? Right? So think about that. Think about who's, who's got solutions to your problem. I know you do. It's not me. Okay, recreating your daily experience starts inside your mind. I recently have been learning about consciousness of consciousness. You see, your brain's on the inside. It can't see the outside world. It hears what you say. When I have colleagues around me all the time saying, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, it turns out the body believes it, the mind believes it. Stop saying that. The words are our reality. Words, actions, they create the culture and the change that you want, right? So humans have capability of experiencing all the left side, right, amazing stuff calm, forgiveness, inspired, but I'm the same person who has everything on the right side. It's just that when I'm in a downward spiral, because I'm not taking care of myself, and then I'm not sleeping, I'm not exercising, all of a sudden, right, I'm, I'm stuck on the right-hand side. Uh, does anyone know why zebras don't get ulcers? Raise your hand if you do. Oh, we have one. Do you want to share? Okay, um, you read it. Do not read the book. It is so boring, right? Back me up on that. Dry, dry. Don't read it. I'm going to tell you why zebras don't get ulcers. Uh, and tell me if I'm wrong. Okay, so zebras don't get ulcers because they're out, they're out there in the desert and somebody, you know, let's say a lion comes and is going to chase them. Oh my God, they're running, running, running. So two things can happen. You're either going to survive the chase or your lunch. If your lunch you know, God bless you, we're not going to worry about what happens to you, you're not going to get an ulcer, you know, the ulcer is really not important at that point. <laughs> if you survive the chase, it turns out a zebra then calms down, he's no longer threatened. His cortisol level drops, physiologically everything comes back down. Oh, humans aren't like that. We got this amazing thing in the brain, recall. Anytime you recall an experience, your body doesn't know that it's not real. Remember I told you about my PTSD and I get moved to tears when I talk about it? Because when I talk about it, it is happening right now. But over the years, the insult, the elevated cortisol, the inability to recover, this is what happens. This is how a human body breaks down. So if we're going to take care of other people and we're not exercising and we're not eating healthy and we're, you know, whatever it is we're doing that's not saving us, no good. Ulcers the least of your problems. But I will disclose I've had lifelong issues with GI problems. And I think I was recently shocked how many of my colleagues as physicians are on proton pump inhibitors and all these medications. Yeah. So um, accountability. I learned something. Okay. I used to say to my, my miracle pregnancy gift of a child, Mommy, I don't have time. I don't have time. Mommy, can we play? I hate playing, by the way. I hate playing. <laughs> I didn't go to fellowship for how to sit and do the doll thing. I'm a surgeon who's impatient, okay? Any of you want to help me? Let's make that a workshop. Okay. So, okay. So, exercise is a must. You got to sleep at least six, seven hours, okay? You are time. I challenge myself to never say that to my husband or daughter. What we say in our house is, Honey, now's not a good time. Mommy's in the middle of something. Can you give me five minutes? Okay, so you are time. You are time. 
Um, this is a book our, exec, our new CEO gave to a, our CMO who bought it for the physician leaders. It's called Younger Next Year. They have a version for men and one for women. The motto is we're all aging, but we don't have to decay. So um, you have to work out like your life depends on it and resistance training is really important, okay? So um, real quick, couple slides on energy management. This is my free PR for Johnson & Johnson Human Performance Institute. Um, how many people here, raise your hand if you think energy comes from Starbucks, raise your hand. <laughs> raise your, don't you lie, I see you in the lines at the airport, okay? Yeah, I'll tell you where the secret of energy comes from. Oh, this slide, boy, it sure broke my heart. Like I said, my birthday's coming up. Yeah, I'm gonna be 49. So look, when we're humans at 30, our capacity, capacity physically, emotionally, man, we're peaking. You know, I was uh, jogging along Lake Michigan trying to find a man, because I was single during fellowship and uh, highly motivated. But the demands on my life were, 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 I look hot, by the way, back then, yeah. Okay, the demands on my life then, I was single, I didn't have kids, my parents were healthy, you know, pretty good. Now you look at me, this could be any one of us, right? As we physically age, the capacity goes down, but the demand goes up. I've got kid, I've got aging parents, I've got, you know, I mean, so my professional responsibilities go up. So you're at a crisis point unless you do something about it. Um, the energy management training, and they have a one-day course, okay? Managing energy, not time, please stop the, there are some of us humans out there who are not efficient, but for the most part, the perspective is how do you manage your, man, manage your energy better? Okay, I love the, uh, anybody who's gonna go in the OR, the sinusoidal wave of life. <laughs> Up here is when we interact with patients and colleagues and anybody, you gotta expend energy. You bring your good energy. But after doing that all day, we're exhausted. So just like every one of us will charge our cell phone, right? you have to recover. So the last several years, I've been very intentional about what recovery looks like for me. I love tennis, I play high school tennis. I didn't play for decades, but now I play every weekend, unless I can't. Um, and every Saturday I walk with my weekend boyfriend, he's 78, we walk our dogs from 5.30, 6 a.m. till about um, eight o'clock. Nobody else is awake, I live in a beautiful uh, neighborhood, and um, we walk and we talk, and nature is my greatest recovery. So that's something that um, I go towards. I'm gonna confess, I'm against the word resilience, but that's my personal, resilience, not that it's not important, it's a valid concept, but oftentimes it gives you the impression that you as a, you're not strong enough. You need to go to resilience training so you can endure more. I don't think so, right? So resilience is about how you recharge, not how you endure. This is in the Harvard Business Review, and I really enjoy this article. Four dimensional of energy, the foundation is physical. You're not gonna have physical energy or adequate amount if you are not healthy, period. Emotional is the, the quality of the energy, mental is focus, and spiritual. Um, so two ways to, to have bad energy, right? You can't fully engage. One is you just have poor energy management. The ranting and raving and going off about what's wrong with everybody except you, yeah, you're losing energy. Insufficient capacity is when you're not eating well, not healthy, et cetera. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I gotta play this video. Okay. Let me, let me do that so I can get it up for you again. Okay, if it takes two, I'm, I'm so sorry about, the videos are like the best part of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's not your fault. I, mm. I didn't mean to put poor Byron in the spotlight <laughs> like I'm blaming him. All right, if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll wrap up because I do want to. Yes, I'm just trying to make sure. You get <laughs> Dude, I'm on a roll. Now is not a good time to stop. <laughs> okay, let's try it. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. You need to come out to the slideshow. Okay. Okay, don't worry about it. Let it play. Okay. No, it's coming out of the. Yeah. Okay. Still not working. Okay, 
پسرم هم بزرگ So I, <laughs> um, okay, final, last uh, couple slides. You know, what can the physicians that work with you and the chiefs and leaders do? I think it is their responsibility to create an incredible positive environment and culture. They need to advocate for resources for not just physicians, right, but all the advanced practitioners. How we message matters, right? I mentioned about the RVUs. Um, they really need to listen to your reality. So um, I hope that you'll leave this meeting and this trip and just take the time to think about for yourself what's working for you in your life and what's not and, and how you can take better care of yourself. I've learned to plan my non-work time with intention. I used to be that woman who, you know, look, I'm the bread earner, I'm the surgeon, so come weekend when I'm not working, I'll say, okay, let's go family, quality time, quality time, it's right now, this is the only window I have. <laughs> it turns out that's not how it works, okay? So we talk about what we need to do together. I'm begging you, if you are suffering, if you are suffering, please ask for help. If you have unhealthy coping mechanism, if you are in a dark place, reach out to somebody. Do not suffer alone, okay? Um, the Morris, this is on the side of our home office in Jacksonville. Uh, Mr. DuPont says it is the duty of everyone to do what is within his power to alleviate human suffering. And at our hospital and system, I change that a little bit. Our mission is to alleviate human to alleviate human suffering must include physicians and providers. I don't collect fancy cars, just sunrise and sunsets. Thank you so much.